We're going to turn our attention now to the com human element of the compliance with hand hygiene. And we have our friend and colleague, the physician director of Chica Canada, uh, Michael Gardam. And uh, Michael is, uh, it says here, he's fiercely committed to patient safety. He's just fierce um, about all kinds of things, uh, particularly patient safety and infection control, as you know. Um, he's the director of uh, infection control at the University Health Network in Toronto and uh, worked for a period at the, as the, uh, really the founding director of the Infectious Prevention Control at the Ontario Agency for Health Protection, Protection and Promotion uh, until 2010. Uh, Mike is uh, devoted to uh, uncovering uh, new ways to prevent the spread of infectious diseases, uh, both in healthcare settings and in the community settings. Um, he has uh, championed the elimination of our superbugs, uh, has our physician director of uh, Chica Canada, and as the national lead of the new approach to controlling superbugs initiative for the Safer Healthcare Now program through Canadian Patient Safety Institute, and using a number of efforts uh, in the use of behavioral change techniques and uh, particularly positive deviance uh, to prevent healthcare associated infections. Uh, Michael's other passion is uh, tuberculosis. He's the medical director of the TB clinic at the Toronto Western Hospital that he started in 2000. And um, he is uh, recognized internationally as an expert on the issue of patient safety, on issues of TB, SARS, pandemic flu, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Michael is uh, assistant professor at the University of Toronto and is an active uh, investigator in a number of areas with a, a large number of publications to his credit. He's a uh, McGill grad, and uh, he's going to speak to us this evening regarding uh, compliance monitoring for hand hygiene. Michael. Thanks very much, and uh, thank you very much to Gojo for inviting me here this evening. Um, what I want to do is really, uh, I thought we heard a really a great, uh, a great lecture before me about sort of the basic science around hand hygiene, many of the things that we kind of take for granted we never really think that much about. Um, and what I'm going to talk about now is something very practical. I'm going to talk about hand hygiene auditing and some of the issues around that. And um, I'll talk about sort of the very uh, traditional gold standard models that we use, but also some other models that we, uh, we've, we've had some, some uh, success with. And then finally finish off with perhaps the future of hand hygiene auditing and uh, hopefully get you interested in that. So. This is a staged photograph. Uh, most of our healthcare workers are not that happy when they clean their hands, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, Shauna here is very happy, and you can, you, can, you can see Melissa poking around the corner seeing if she's actually cleaning her hands or not. That's sort of the, the gold standard traditional hand hygiene auditing. Um, just out of curiosity in the room, how many of you uh, working in infection control are actually responsible for hand hygiene auditing? You actually go out and audit it. How does that feel? I heard a horrible from the front of the room. Uh, we've had our hand hygiene aud auditors called narcs. We've had boxes of gloves thrown at them. Uh, it's not always a very pleasant, pleasant job to audit, to audit hand hygiene, to say the least. How many of you have people who are completely outside of infection control who do this and they just sort of report back the numbers? So actually, I think the majority of you actually are auditing hand hygiene. That's interesting. I didn't realize that. So. You're very familiar with this. You can do this on paper, you can do this on iPads or on handhelds, or you can have it completely uh, 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 a manual or the other way around. There's all sorts of different ways of, of doing that. But we all know that there's some concerns about having somebody stand there on the corner watching you as you're, as you're cleaning your hands. And, the, the, you know, so who's doing it? You've already kind of answered that. Uh, most of you are, actually. Training is really important. Um, we do this thing, we've got about six or seven people that, that regularly do auditing at UHN, and, and we often do Kappa scores between them to see if they actually, you know, is there huge variation between them? We'll get emails from somebody saying, you know, so-and-so was auditing hand hygiene this week and our rates dropped, what's with that? And so we'll actually go back and look at and see what they called and what they didn't call. And by and large, that, that training piece becomes really important um, because you can get huge variations and that can undermine you very quickly. If somebody feels somebody has an agenda or something going on, it can really hurt your program. Um, the number of measurements is really important. We do about 10,000 uh, hand hygiene measurements a year, but we're also a pretty big organization. We try to do 60 measurements per month per inpatient unit, which actually from a stats perspective isn't nearly enough. 
um, but it's still more than a lot of places do. But there's only honestly so much money and effort you can put into hand hygiene auditing. It's especially if most of you are actually doing that on top of your regular job. You're actually doing infection control, other work on, on, on top of all of that. We also find it ha hard to keep full-time hand hygiene auditors doing hand hygiene auditing for a long time because it's not the funnest of jobs, uh, to say the least. The standardized approach, as I've already kind of mentioned, is, is, is really important. And the data collection tools, how many of you do this on paper? How many of you are using like an iPad to collect your information? So a few of you. Um, how many of you are using iScrub, the free program you can get off the web? How about Mariner, the uh, wireless one? We're using that one. Um, Handy Audit? A few of you, okay. So different smatterings around. There's sort of pros and cons for all of these. Um, I know people that have switched from paper to electronic, it's lovely because it saves a heck of a lot of time and you're just pushing buttons rather than filling out little, little dots and that sort of thing. Um, the data feedback piece is really important. How many of you intervene? So if you see somebody who's not cleaning their hands appropriately, you go, whoa, bucko. <laughs> Take it up a notch. You only pumped 1.3 milliliters onto that hand. I saw that. <laughs> Get out the ruler. So how many of you specifically don't intervene? Or how many of you intervene if you, only if you see something really scary and most of the time you're a fly on the wall? That's sort of our, our program. We kind of, it's kind of evolved into that. Initially, we were trying to give uh, in the moment feedback and as I said, our auditors were getting called narcs and having things thrown at them and they basically said, we're walking off the job if you make us keep inter intervening with people. And this was about five years ago. Our hand hygiene culture has changed dramatically since then. But early on, they basically said, we're not, we're not going to intervene anymore. Um, they do have the rule, though, that if they, if they see something really scary, like the classic surgeons rounding at 6.30 in the morning with the coffee, coffee cup down, hands in the wound, about to walk and touch the next wound, they will stop them. But by and large, they are just a fly on the wall. Who do you feed the data back to? So let's say, for example, you've, you've done your number of measurements for that month. Does that data go into a central repository or do you feed it back directly to the manager? How many of you give sort of in, in, in the moment immediate feedback to the manager, this is how your unit did? Depends. You can do that. How many of you routinely always do that? Like the managers are expecting to hear about it. We do that. How many of you kind of keep it and then you send it out centrally and everybody knows about it? A little, bit, a little bit of mix. How many of you post it publicly? We do that. Okay. So different, di different mixtures around there. Um, one of the things that we've done, and I'll talk about a little bit later, is we will, often our managers want to know who wasn't cleaning their hands, right? So if you say, you know, you did pretty well this month, but uh, there was a nurse that was out there actually, you know, gleefully hopping patient to patient, spreading organisms around and... and that was really pretty scary. They want to know, give me a name. How many of you will give the name? That's interesting, eh? Not, not, that's, that's really interesting because managers want that, right? They want to know the name of the person who didn't clean their hands. We specifically don't give them the names either. I'm not suggesting that's a good or bad idea. We, we've sort of evolved our program to specifically not tell them who's not cleaning their hands. We'll tell them by group, but not by name. So that's neat. We're all kind of doing a very similar thing there. There's obviously bias uh, when you're observing somebody do this, not to mention the fact that you can't watch them all the time, right? So you can see them in the hallway, but as Dr. Jarvis was mentioning, as they're walking in the room, they're running their hand along the bed rail of the patient beside them. They didn't really clean their hands, but unless you're able to poke your head around the corner and, and see in, you may actually, you may actually miss them. Um, there's obviously also selection bias, right? Because when you're auditing hand hygiene, you're sort of picking up different targets as you're doing your auditing. And what if you just decide one day, you know, that nurse is particularly not cleaning their hands. I'm just going to keep following that person for the next three hours. <laughs> um, and, you know, with a personal vendetta. We had that once happen in our emergency department where there was, you know, we do 60 measurements a month, as I mentioned. And we had one nurse who was followed for eight moments and missed all eight. Yeah, that's not good, right? Um, so 
when we fed that back to the emergency department, you know, the manager, I think, was uh, appropriately upset, saying, this is a very biased sample. You happened to find the ultimate dud, and you followed them for eight moments. <laughs> and, you know, that's not really helping us improve. I mean, that's great. You found that person, but maybe spread out the measurements a little more, because otherwise you can get a fairly, a fairly narrow selection bias. On the other hand, you may also sometimes get on someone who's really good and want to follow them along. So there's huge amounts of bias in hand hygiene. So we all know that the numbers that we're reporting aren't the truth. They're a measurement. But we all know, especially in Ontario, where all of our numbers are, are posted publicly, we all know that there's a suspiciously high amount of hand hygiene going on in Ontario, uh, which is above that's stuff that's actually reported in the literature. And again, it, it speaks to bias. People are not purposely, obviously, fudging their data. It's simply, it's, it's a, probably some of it relates to the bias around the measurement, and some of it relates to genuine improvement. But it's very hard to tease out kind of what is what. Is what. So is hand hygiene an, an educational opportunity? I think we've already answered that, which is, by and large, most of you are, are, are saying that you're not really using auditing for education. You're, you're, you're using auditing for auditing purposes, and you're not giving a lot of in-the-moment feedback. The iHeart audits, by the way, is the hand hygiene auditor, in case you're wondering who that is. Um, that's yeah. So the approach that we've used... Is, the... the uh, the uh, approach that we've used at UHM, which has worked surprisingly well for us, and I'm just telling you the story not because um, we're so brilliant. We didn't actually think of this ahead of time. It just kind of sort, sort of evolved this way. So the managers would want to know who's not cleaning their hands, and we specifically would say, no, we're not telling you. And that pissed them off, like really pissed them off. And I've been called into probably... 15, 16 meetings with various leaders in our organization with the thumb screws trying to get me to release the, you know, tell the auditors to give names because how are we going to improve our staff's performance if we don't know who's doing a bad job? And we said, no, we're not going to tell you. And uh, most of that was to protect the auditors because they were losing their minds and seriously they were going to walk off the job. But the other reason that turned out that worked really well is it made the managers get out of their offices and start walking around to try to find these people. So it actually got the managers engaged by kind of teasing them with part of the information, but not all of it, and made them get out of their offices and start looking. Well, how are they going to look? Well, they might learn how to audit themselves. We're not going to count those numbers, because those are going to be crazily biased, but why don't they start looking themselves? And so we started to get managers who started to go out and buy iPads, and we started training them how to do hand hygiene auditing initially with iScrub and then with Handy Audit and other things. And they started going around doing auditing. They start, some of them started training their educators or their you know, different nursing staff would go out and they would start auditing. And that has had a really interesting effect because they can intervene. Because you know, if you're the manager walking around and you see someone not cleaning their hands, you're perfectly within your rights to call them on it, and they're probably not going to throw something at you. If they do, you know what to do about it. So that was one little tweak for us that actually worked really well. And again, it, was, it wasn't intentional, but by giving them part of the information, it started to engage them. And you know me, I'm all about engagement, uh, getting them to be interested in starting to audit hand hygiene. So we, we didn't stop there. One of the, one of the things that really uh, strikes us about... Um, infection control in general, right, is always a discussion about how do we engage the physicians. The physicians are disengaged. They're bored. They're not listening to us. If only there was a billing code for hand hygiene, they'd all be doing a brilliant job, et cetera, et cetera. We've all heard it, right? But we really struggled, and I actually purposely avoided our physicians in our hospital when I was talking about hand hygiene because I was afraid of them, number one. And I was sick of getting asked, you know, prove to me that hand hygiene does something. Where's the randomized control trial? You know, we've all heard that, right? And so I kind of left them alone. But then we sort of, again, stumbled upon how to engage physicians. And it happened on, on one of our units. And on this particular unit, and those of you who have heard me speak before know that I'm very big in, again, into frontline empowerment and positive deviance. And each floor in our hospital has their own hand hygiene program. We don't have a centralized program at all anymore. They all do their own thing to try to improve hand hygiene compliance. 
which sounds weird, but it works remarkably well. Um, on one of her floors, one of the nurse managers, her approach was to wash the hands of the surgeons when they rounded in the morning. She would carry a bottle of Purell and she'd say, oh, Dr. So-and-so, I'm sorry, you forgot to clean your hands. May I wash them for you? <laughs> and it was this, you know, like, screw you, buddy, I'm going to wash your hands. And so she would pump the gel and she'd put their hands in their hands and she would wash their hands for them. And it was this remarkably obnoxious approach to hand hygiene. <laughs> But they loved it. The, 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 the surgeons thought it was hysterical. They had this relationship with her, and the residents and fellows got into it, and it was this big thing. And as time went on, she could just shake the Purell bottle, and they'd all clean their hands like trained puppies. And then one day she said to the head orthopedic surgeon, she said, you know, why don't, would you mind auditing hand hygiene for five minutes? Here, you know, we'll give you an iPad. Why don't you go out and audit hand hygiene just so you can kind of see what we see? He's like, okay, whatever. At this point, he's kind of bought into it a little bit. He takes the iPad out and he starts auditing hand hygiene. And he starts noticing that people aren't washing their hands all over the place. He never, no he never looked before. It's that concept of sort of ethnographic observation where you kind of remove yourself from your normal role and you take a few minutes and just look. And for the first time in his life, he looked. And then he started talking about it because at this point, he'd kind of been trained that hand washing is important. And he started freaking out because he saw people weren't doing it. So once you've got one surgeon who's done it, right, you've got a little toe in the door now, right? So then we started talking to other surgeons. Our former surgeon in chief started auditing hand hygiene. And he was very supportive of our program, but he always thought that hand hygiene was a little bit, you know, OCD-ish, like you guys are a little bit crazy about this stuff. And when he started auditing it, first of all, he noticed none of his residents and fellows and fellow staff members were cleaning their hands, and he was shocked. Because people don't think about other people, they just think about themselves. So he thought he was doing a great job, so they were too, and they weren't. The other thing he noticed is that as he's standing there auditing hand hygiene, they're all walking into the C. diff rooms without following precautions. And you've got a team of 10 people in a room of a patient with C. diff, and then they come out, and then they go into the next room. So not, not only did he notice that they weren't cleaning their hands, he noticed that they weren't following precautions, and he also noticed why the hell are 10 of them in the room? Why isn't just one of them in the room? This person's got C. difficile, and this is the general surgery floor where they're doing colectomies on people with C. difficile on a regular basis. So his five minutes of hand hygiene auditing not only opened his eyes, but he started changing practice on his unit, where they started now, they had a new rule that they were only going to go in, you know, two, you know, two people would go into a room when somebody was in isolation. They would gown up appropriately, and they fundamentally started changing their practices, all because of that auditing piece. So getting those people that are just like you out there auditing is incredibly powerful. And by doing more and more of that, we engaged our physicians and surgeons. Because the thing about engaging us as doctors is that, you know, we may be willing to do what you want us to do, but you have to tell us what you want us to do. Like, what is it? So this was giving them a very concrete task for them to do. Um, we're getting into the patient auditing game. Uh, we've got some parts. I also am, I'm also work at Women's College Hospital, which is 100% ambulatory care. And um, it's very hard, very hard to audit hand hygiene um, compliance in a family practice clinic where the auditor, the only hand hygiene really occurs in the room with the door closed, so the auditor has to stand in the room. And they were doing this. You'd have the patient, the physician, hey, I'm the hand, I'm the hand hygiene auditor. How you doing? Right? I'm just... I'm going to stand here for 10 minutes to see if you clean your hands. Um, that didn't go over well. Uh, they didn't enjoy that. Um, so we started looking at this, and this you can see from this card. It originally came from Hopkins. And there's going to be huge issues with bias, huge issues with bias and, and people not filling it out correctly. But you're engaging patients. So there's, there, there's downsides to this in terms of accuracy, but there's huge plus sides to this in terms of engaging patients and getting them to start being involved in their own, in their own safety. So we're going to try this out at Women's College. I'll let you know next year how well it's working. But um, it's, it's a neat idea because we do a lot of things to patients in healthcare. We do very few things with them in healthcare. So we've got all these issues with human auditing and stuff, and, and I've shown you that there's some types of auditing that can not be very accurate, but it can be very powerful from a behavioral perspective. But what else is there? What else is out there on the, on the, uh, on the horizon in terms of hand hygiene auditing? 
So WHO has written uh, a little paper on what would be the perfect auditing system. You have to, it has to be unbiased, exact measurement. So you're, getting a, you're actually getting a measure of the, of the truth rather than a surrogate for the truth. Doesn't interfere with behavior. So in other words, you don't even know what's going on. You're just doing whatever you're doing. You can actually show that you're killing organisms. So imagine, you know, walking into a room, putting gel on, and you can see a bar somewhere decreasing because you've killed the organisms on your hands. Captures, uh, it, it actually, actually accurately captures even complex tasks. So, you know, the moving from patient and touching stuff, it could pick that up. It has to be super cheap. You know, good luck with all this. But anyway, that's the, that's the idea with the, 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 the sort of the ideal system. And there's a number of systems now which are automated hand hygiene systems which are now coming on the market that I thought I would, I, I would talk about. Remember this from uh, 2001, the computer? Anyway, those of you that were born pre-1970 will get this reference. Anyway, um, but so I'm going to talk now about automated hand hygiene uh, compliance monitoring. And you may have, there was a lot of media interest from New York City of a place that had installed video cameras where they were actually filming healthcare workers walking in and out of rooms and that videotape was being sent in real time to a bunch of people in a dark room who were actually assessing whether they cleaned their hands appropriately or not. And then it was fed back to, a, to an actual ticker tape on the unit that was reporting back real time hand hygiene compliance. Yeah, wow. Um, I got asked about this uh, a couple times and I'm thinking, okay, putting video cameras to watch hand hygiene compliance in a Canadian unionized environment. <laughs> Not sure how that's going to go over, but neat idea. And, and, and they, were, so they were talking about it, and the healthcare workers were very excited about it. According to the article, they really got into it, and they were really cheering that the rates were going up, which is, which is what you want to see. Um, so that's one way that people have uh, tried to start doing this. There's another product, and there's, many, there's several products in the market now. I'm just sort of giving some examples. One of them is, is High Green. How many of you have heard of High Green? few of you. So it's one where essentially you can see by the pictures here in the first picture, the person's cleaning their hands with either soap and water or with alcohol gel. They then put their hand under essentially a breathalyzer, which is measuring the alcohol on your hand. So if you had a glass of scotch for lunch, it'll pick that up as well. <laughs> um, but essentially it's measuring the alcohol on your hand. And by doing that, it's then communicating with a little badge that you're wearing. And that badge um, is now detected whether you cleaned your hands or not. As you walk towards the patient, uh, as you get to the patient's zone, if you haven't cleaned your hands, the badge starts to vibrate to remind you. And if you did clean your hands, it's actually going to glow green. So the patient's going to see you and know that you've, you've cleaned your hands appropriately. So there are other versions of this. There are versions of this that are basically tracking hand hygiene compliance in and out of the room, which is not so bad if you're in a single room. It's not so hot if you're in a four bedded room because God knows what you're doing once you're in there. But you get the idea. There's, and then these things can actually all report back to a central monitoring system which actually plots stats. And it can actually plot stats according to your name. Oh, I like, I like that response. So you can actually get results for Michael Gardam, how Michael Gardam is doing. Or you can block that and just get results for physicians, results for nurses, etc. So the CDC um, has recently published a paper on how are healthcare workers going to like these concepts. So they did a couple of focus groups with uh, people from three, three different hospitals and interviewed sort of top, you know, sort of senior senior leaders, mid management, and then frontline workers, and they looked at what they thought about this kind of technology in terms of how aware they were, how comfortable they were with it. Uh, 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 situational tolerance, in other words, are there circumstances where this would really annoy you and circumstances where you'd be happy with it, how they'd want their data fed back, etc. So perhaps not surprising, the senior leaders were more aware of the technology and they were also quite comfortable with monitoring people's hand hygiene compliance. And the factors that were influencing people's comfort with this technology was how accurate it is. So can you imagine walking in and out of a room, doing work for a week, and then getting a report back under your name which says your compliance is 30%. Your third, your, probably your first comment out of your mouth is going to be, how accurate is that thing? Because I'm sure I do better than that. So you'd need to have a system that you feel pretty confident it's measuring what you're actually doing. Some of these systems, for example, depending what 
what uh, technology they use to actually, uh, to actually find you, some of it can actually go through walls. So, for example, you could, be, you could be standing on one side of a wall, but the system thinks you're on the other side of the wall right next to the patient, and it could ding you for not cleaning your hands. It's like, dude, there's a brick wall there. I can't clean my hands through the brick wall. So there's things like that that people bring up very, 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 very quickly. Um, people don't have a lot of knowledge about these things, so they wonder how safe is it, etc. Large concern around punitive use. So if it reports back 40%, what are you going to do to me? Right? Because right now, pretty much all of you have said when you do human auditing, you're not feeding back by the individual. You're feeding back as a group. This has the potential to feed back for the individual. And then if you start time stamping it and know where, when, what, and what location you're in, people said that feels like, feels like Big Brother, like you're actually watching me and, and watching what I'm doing. They also talked about who gets the data. The frontline staff said they should get the data. The mid-level staff said they should get the data. And the senior leaders felt that everybody should get the data, which is probably, in my mind, the best answer, right? Everybody should be able to see this information. And in terms of real-time versus periodic, periodic feedback, it was quite interesting. Most frontline healthcare workers didn't want a thing that buzzed or a thing that glowed and sort of immediately reminded them. They just wanted feedback as sort of aggregate data later on. But when you go up the organizational ladder, more and more people wanted immediate feedback, which is interesting. A bit of a disconnect between what the frontline staff want and what the senior leadership team wants. So here's a couple quotes that I quite liked. Um, in terms of talking about this kind of automated monitoring, one person said it could have an impact that could be sustainable as long as it was done as part of a comprehensive program that the employees felt involved in. That sounds like a sort of engagement comment there, that frontline have to be engaged in this process if you're going to do it. If it was seen as something that could actually help us manage, our, manage patients better. If it was explained in the right way to employees, you could get individuals to actually want to do it. So the trick is, if you're going to bring something like this in, the employees have to really get on board and want to see it happen. Otherwise, they could see it as very sort of intrusive. So I know of what I speak uh, because we're um, the first site in the world to do a pilot project of a, of a technology out of Ontario called Hospital Watch Live, which takes this surveillance to another level. And I'm going to tell you a little about the project. I wanted to show you uh, data. I was hoping we'd have some data from the project at this, at this stage, but I'm probably, probably about a month too early to be able to show you that. So I'll just tell you the concepts of this. Um, and let me give, give you a sense of kind of what this is doing. So imagine if you could track where everything is on a unit in real time. All the pieces of equipment, the beds, the mattresses, the patients, and the healthcare workers. If you could plot them out on a uh, floor map of the unit and knew where all of them were and how they were all interacting with each other in real time. So what if you could measure that in terms of, of time and space? And at the same time, what if you could provide hand hygiene compliance by patient? So in other words, Mr. Smith, who's in bed three, here's his hand, hand hygiene compliance for the day. And this is the mattress. These are the mattresses he's been in contact with over the last week. This is the bed he's been in contact with. These are the other patients he's been in contact with. These are the large pieces of equipment like uh, uh, commodes and blood pressure cuffs and all that junk that this person has been in contact with. That's what this system does. So how does it work? So you have that receiver uh, up there on the, uh, the, the top right-hand side. When these are placed every six feet in our ICU and in our multi-organ transplant program. And basically, there are little transmitters. Staff are volunteering to wear, to wear badges. You can see on that picture in the bottom left, there's a staff member with a little badge on. That badge links with the alcohol gel dispenser when those, that knows when it's been pumped and it's now reporting immediately to a, to a receiver. Patients are also wearing a badge. And then other large pieces of, uh, of uh, uh, equipment are also wearing badges. So what it means is if I'm wearing a badge and I'm going into a two-bedded room, it knows that I walked in the room. It knows that I pumped. It knows what direction I'm facing. It knows what patient I've touched. It knows whether I pumped it again. It knows everything. And it's being fed back to a relational database, and it's then pumping out information every, every few seconds if you wanted it. So you can imagine instead of 60 measurements per month, you're getting 60 measurements a minute 
in terms of hand hygiene compliance. So this is the way it looks. It actually goes onto the floor map of, of, of the unit. And so um, if this isn't something you really look at, this is all done in the back end with a relational database, and it's sort of printing out reports. But if you wanted to find where all of your blood pressure cups were or all of your ultrasound machines were, you could push a button and they would light up on the floor map, which is a nice added benefit for the frontline staff. Here's an example of some of the hand hygiene compliance reporting. So you could report per individual patient compliance. You could break it down by healthcare worker type, et cetera. You can imagine how people could feel threatened by this. The level of data collection in this, I've never seen anything like this before. And so the trick is all about how do you engage people to be able to use the, for, for them to use this information. Um, what about contact tracing? Let's say you've got a patient in a room who develops C. difficile. Right now, all we'd be able to say is they're in the same room as a, as a previous case of C. difficile, or there's a couple of the cases on the ward with them. Maybe they caught it from somewhere else. Imagine as soon as they develop C. difficile to immediately contact trace every single asset on that unit, and it would immediately tell you what links it has with other cases of C. diff. How many of you have had cases of C. difficile where you wonder if they caught it from the bed rails? I've had a couple of those, where we've admitted a patient into a room, and then that patient gets C. diff, and the patient in that room before also had C. diff, and I wonder if there's a link. This will do this automatically for us. So it'll be able to tell us, because well, one thing I didn't realize, you know when they're cleaning beds and mattresses? Yeah, they don't actually stay together. I always thought they kind of stayed together. The mattresses are going all over the place. The beds are going all over the place. This will tell us where they all are. So it gives us an opportunity to do sort of real-time contact tracing for pieces of equipment, um, which could be really interesting or could be remarkably confusing. We'll find out. That's why we're, that's why we're studying it. Lots of hoops to jump through for this baby, let me tell you. Um, so it went through ethics. It was relatively easy to get this through ethics. So staff that are doing this, staff are volunteering for this. They are providing written informed consent that they're wearing these badges. There is no way with this kind of system that we could force that on our staff and tell them they all have to wear badges. Uh, not a, not in, the early, in, in the early stages of this. We have very, very clear what we're using the information for. Their names are not in the system. I cannot find them in the system because they're not in there. Um, the data will never be fed back by individual because they're not in the system. I can only feed back by, by group. Um, lots of issues surrounding privacy. We've done a, a, a privacy impact assessment. That's taken a while to go through, but that's done. The installation has been very interesting. It, it's costing over $200,000 per ward to do this. Now, again... This is a study. This is not something you're going to buy off a shelf for $200,000 and install in each one of your wards. The final system will inevitably be much, much cheaper than that. But we're kind of doing all the bells and whistles for this to really be able to kick the tires and see how well it works. Um, we have had some issue with staff. It's interesting. We're doing it on two floors. One of our floors loves this program, and it really has no issue with it at all, and it's working very well. The other floor, um, we've had some issues where staff have felt threatened by this and haven't come to, edu have, haven't come to sort of uh, uh, introductory education sessions and things, and we're working through a lot, of those, a, a lot of those issues. We've had some software and hardware bugs. One of the challenges of being an early adopter with something like this is that it, you're the first one doing it, so it takes a while to figure it out. And we had to get outside funding, so the hospital's not actually, not actually paying for this. So... The approaching the big brother issue with this is incredibly important. And so we're basically using our lessons from positive deviance, which is the frontline staff own the data. They tell us what reports they want to see, how they want to see them. We engage them. They make the changes that they want to make. Infection control stays out of it. So they're doing their own thing to try to lead this approach. And they're much, you can imagine they're much more comfortable with that than me showing up with a report and saying, hey, you guys aren't, aren't doing your job. They'll figure out what they're, what they're doing. Um, we have blackout areas. We're not tracking people in their break rooms. We're not tracking them in the washrooms. That would be kind of sick. Uh, so basically, it's in the clinical areas. And again, we're tracking their badges. If somebody wants to uh, basically bypass the system, they take their badge off. And we've done that on purpose. We've made it very 
They need to feel safe doing this kind of thing. We'll get a ton of information out of this, a ton of interesting data, like how many pieces of equipment people come into contact with in a day. I'm sure it's a gazillion. We'll be able to measure all those things, lift up all those rocks we've never been able to lift up before. And as I said, again, the key point is that the frontline staff own the data. So this is my last slide. So in summary, many different types of hand hygiene auditing. You can do it to try to collect as unbiased information as you want. You can do it to engage people, to get them to look at new things. You can do it to be able to provide the feedback that we're not able to provide. Um, you can do it automated. They all have their pros and cons. There's no one, there's no one right way of, of doing this, but I think we use all of them at our organization for different purposes. Now, just to mention, if in case I didn't, the auditing by the nurse managers and the doctors, we don't count any of those numbers. Like we have our own auditors in the background that are collecting information, but they're using it for their own purposes on their, on their units. We don't count those numbers in terms of our official reporting. And the future of automated uh, hand hygiene um, auditing re re remains to be seen. Last check, I believe there's 14 companies that have come to market now looking at automated hand hygiene auditing. So it's everybody's in this everybody's in this the, the, this in this uh, in this game now. So we'll see what happens over the next few years. That's it for me. I think we're both coming up to the podium. Thank you very much, Michael. That's most intriguing. Um, if I have this feeling I'm being followed tonight, I'll know where it's coming from.